Welcome everyone again to another episode of Spilling Tea. My name is Tiffany Daniels. Of course, I am your host. And for this next video for today, we are going to be talking about a topic that has been coming up quite a bit in the actually autistic hashtag community out on Twitter. And we're talking about what is called isolation rooms aka isolation cells. Now the article we're going to be reading today is from the mighty.com. <clears throat> Author is Angela McNair. And this is why I believe it's dangerous for autistic kids to be exposed to isolation rooms in school. So we're going to read through the article and we're going to talk about it a little bit. Isolation rooms are commonly used in many schools, typically with children who are on the autism spectrum. Uh, isolation rooms are essentially a white cement closet with nothing inside. The door has either a small window or small people, and many of them have locks. All you need to do is Google prison solitary confinement rooms, and what pops up is exactly what many isolation rooms look like in our schools. Some schools say they use these time out rooms when the child becomes aggressive, destructive, or can't calm down. I believe we need to sit down, come together as one, and discuss the use of these isolation rooms in the classrooms of our children with disabilities. The policies in my area, Alberta, Canada, are so broad that I believe that they are becoming misused and abused. Children who are nonverbal are winding up in these rooms for hours at a time, unsupervised. Some parents are not notified this is happening. Children are being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder from school. The opportunity for abuse is high and the evidence of abuse is growing. I recently had my own experience with an isolation room. My six-year-old son was diagnosed with autism, Tourette syndrome, nonverbal learning disorder profile, sensory processing disorder, and OCD. I had two meetings with my son's new teacher to discuss a behavior plan, triggers, and ways to manage and approach him. The teacher showed me the chill room, which is now what I know to be the isolation room. I very clearly expressed I did not want this room used because my son would self-harm inside of it and would cause damage to school relationship. I said I specifically moved into this area so I could be less than two minutes away, that in the event anything were to happen, I wanted an immediate phone call and I would come get him. We had a plan that we all, including the teacher, agreed upon. He was to begin a specialized program in a class of six with a teacher and one aide. Everything was so great, we were so incredibly hopeful. Then it was shattered within mere minutes. We set up a time with the teacher for my son to come and do one more school tour, see the class and get acquainted. It was Friday, and my son was apprehensive about the school tour, but excited to play on the playground swings. We walked inside, and the teacher greeted us. My son avoided eye contact and didn't want to engage with him. I encouraged my son and took him by the hand to walk down the hallway. He dropped to the floor as we turned down the hallway. His anxiety set in, and he was nervous, so I physically picked him up and brought him into the class. My son started saying words like, shut up, and didn't want to communicate. The teacher assured me it's all good, but then took a demanding and authoritative approach which triggered my son even more. He was now sitting on a beanbag, not engaging positively, and the teacher said to him, Let me show you this room. My son said okay. The teacher began to open the door and said, When kids are bad, this is where they go. It immediately triggered my son to swat at and spit at him, and the teacher put his hand on on his back. My son then attempted to punch him. The teacher then grabbed my son and threw him inside the isolation room and locked the door. I was in utter shock and I couldn't believe this just happened on a simple tour of the school. I ran up to the door and tried opening it, but I couldn't. I yelled at the teacher in bliss belief that he just ruined any hope for positive interaction. Everything we worked so hard for and to open this door right now. He came back over and opened the door. My son was visibly upset, angry, and scared. The teacher said he needed a moment and left the room. My older son, wide-eyed, was scared too. In a matter of minutes, everything we worked so hard for, 
Everything we were working toward, all our hopes for this school year were shattered. Everything we discussed at this meeting, the teacher had seemingly forgotten. For this teacher to do this in front of me, what could he do when I'm not there? It's a traumatic event for all of us. I'm terrified to send my child to that school, or anywhere for that matter. My son won't stop talking about it. All he says on repeat is, I hate that school, I hate that school, I hate that school. And now, my son has told me, not safe with our in-home workers. He refuses to leave our home, and any hope for school to be positive is gone. For autistic children, it is widely known these isolation rooms do nothing but escalate the situation while also causing severe harm and post-traumatic stress disorder. And in some schools, these rooms are being used as a means to de-escalate a situation. It needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. Teachers need to be provided with proper training when dealing with autistic children. They need more support in the classroom, and they need to listen. These rooms need to be used appropriately with voluntary entry, have sensory equipment inside with parental consent, have video monitoring systems. In the last couple of weeks, isolation rooms have become a big topic within the disabilities community. It has made headlines in my province and many others. Horrifying stories, much worse than my own, are emerging. I know some parents who are suing another school district due to their nonverbal autistic son being locked inside one of these prison cells, naked, unsupervised, and covered in his own feces. When is this abuse going to end? When is the government going to step in and say this stops now? The most vulnerable children in our school systems needs to be protected. Stand up for my son and every other little boy and girl who are vulnerable to this treatment. This conversation is important and we must keep it going until real change happens. Okay. So there you have it right there. And we're going to take a look at some of these comments too. What, so Pamela Smith says, what was the reaction response of the administration? Did they offer any options or suggestions? We are in North Carolina, USA. We didn't have that severe of an experience, my niece, but the school system refused to accept PDD, NOS, as an autistic spectrum diagnosis. And as verbally and very intelligent, they would not provide us with an IEP. That type of punishment would have been catastrophic for her. She would have either shut down altogether or become very aggressive, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Ending in the legal system. I shudder to think that what the long-term complications would have been with a room like that. Because she's also told if she got a 504, which is virtually useless, because there are no legal requirements on documentation of them, and in the middle school, she was... And the admin chose to support the teachers instead of us. On Halloween of her eighth grade year, 2005, was the last straw. So the teachers and administrators were bullying her and us as much as the children were. She was having daily panic attacks and they chose to concentrate on the fact that they had known all along that she lived with my father and I in the next county. But her mother, who was her legal guardian, lived in that county. We pulled her out that day and tried to homeschool. The school's response was to charge us with truancy. We were finally given the correct papers to remove her from the school. She became agoraphobic for the next two years, losing two doctors in the process because I couldn't care get her out of the house. Homeschooling was difficult because I worked full time and she was home with my father, who wasn't in a position health wise to force the issue. When she turned 16, she refused to do any more because she knew that legally she could. At 26, she has what I call her autism age, behavioral, social, emotional of about 8 or 10, and I refer to her cognitive age as 42 with a PhD. We don't really have a cognitive age for her, but she is very intelligent. She, has, she never has gone back to school. She has no use for anything that is like the school situation she was in, but she loves to read, is interested in a variety of subjects, and is very much self-educated. Her dream job, I am exploring training options to operate heavy machinery. She's just over four feet tall, but extraordinarily strong. Go figure. Okay. So, yeah, you're obviously seeing in the comments here 
that this is very bad. Very bad. Okay, here's the thing. I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate, something that I don't do necessarily very often, but just in this case. Here, let me move this. I might be able to see a little bit better. There we go. Let's play devil's advocate a little bit, all right? Okay. You have someone who is either getting ready to go into or is going into an autistic snap, also known as an autistic meltdown, right? Now, playing devil's advocate, being honest in regards to myself, especially when I was little. Yes, I would hurl objects. Yes, I would scream. Yes, I would pound my tiny fists into the doors, into walls, heck, in, even into myself on occasion. These are all facts. Playing devil's advocate, you would think that just having a place where you can set that child aside so that they're able to calm down would be a good thing. Okay. Granted. Granted. Okay. If that is the case, why in the name of God are they throwing these children into a closet? A white-walled, tiny closet. Think about that for a minute. There is an infinite number of ways that in meltdown, while they're in that room, that they can hurt themselves. You have no idea what level of strength that we are operating with when we're in the middle of a meltdown, okay? It's a massive amount of strength. And if you're like throwing yourself into walls, hitting walls at full force due to having an autistic snap, the damage you can do to yourself is insane. Okay? Especially if you're being left alone in a tiny room. Number two. If we're looking at the reasons why these people are getting thrown into tiny little closets. It's because you have teachers with absolutely no training. And are literally telling the kids that they're being stuck in there for being naughty due to traits that we have no control over. Okay? We don't. That anxiety, that the stuff that comes up, we have no way of hiding that. It's just there. And we are getting punished for things over which we have no control over. It's... It's not just abusive, it's an attempt at behavioral control. You're not acting normal. You are disrupting me. You see, you're disrupting me, you're making my life harder. So instead of me being the adult and finding out what's causing the issues, and doing something about the issues or talking to the parents about the issues so we can come up with a reasonable solutions and accommodations to stop these situations from popping up or at least lessening them. What I'm going to do is throw you in a closet. I'm going to lock the door and I'm going to forget you're there and I'm going to go ahead and focus on these normal kids. That is essentially what seems to be coming out. That's what seems to be coming out. Now, I am in no way hampering down on teachers. They get more burdens thrown on them and told under to operate and provide on lower salaries way more than they should possibly be. The demands on them to get extra trainings, well, the trainings 
cost money. And not every school is going to be wanting to take that money from the freaking football team in order to get these teachers to proper training that they need. So we're not constantly throwing children into freaking isolation cells. So what's the solution here? Well, we got to get back to basics, folks. We got to get out of our heads here. This, we can't keep treating children as objects that are out of sight, out of mind. Even a person without necessarily any training, if they think about it a minute, can think, maybe I need to figure out what is causing the behavior and work on what's causing that behavior instead of punishing someone for that behavior. Especially when that kid's got a diagnosis. Especially when that kid's got a diagnosis. The lack of common sense when it comes to these schooling systems not just for the disabled kids, not just for the neurodevelopmental kids, but the lack of common sense for these kids, period, in schools has been going downhill since the 90s. Since the 90s. It's this, we're not paying our teachers well. We are throwing money at the wrong things into the sports programs. We're not focusing on the educational clubs and programs and special ed and programs that actually need the money that are actually the ones teaching kids. Sorry. I've been mad about that since high school. Obviously. It's just... The money's not being spent right. The teachers, due to not having the adequate funds, are not getting the training that they need. Because they're not getting the training that they need, situations like this happen. So... What is the answer? Start holding the schools accountable for how they spend their money, what they're spending their money on, and how these teachers are treating your kids. If you hear that these isolation rooms are going up in your school district, get involved. Get involved. Even if your kid doesn't have a disability, get involved. It is a human rights issue. All right? Okay. That's all I got for this afternoon, folks. I do appreciate your time once again. Now, my history side, my, my main page, my home screen is still wide clean of videos, folks. So please... As these new videos come up, please click on the videos tab. All my videos will pop right up for you. Now, we don't get that many views here on YouTube, and the few we do get do tend to be, well, vanish. So if you could, please don't forget to hit the like button. Hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the comments. I do appreciate your time this afternoon, and as always, folks, I do hope you have... A good one. Bye-bye.